one of those days. I'm Chris Kemp. For, for those of you who don't know me, I'm actually one of the original founders of the OpenStack project. Um, I had the great pleasure while I was the chief technology officer of NASA to pull an amazing team of engineers together that built Nova, uh, which is the compute engine uh, in OpenStack. We open sourced that, and uh, I had the opportunity of getting up uh, with, with uh, Lou Mormon and uh, announcing OpenStack on stage at OSCON back in 2010. But uh, as I listened to uh, Surendra talk about his experience with uh, the alpha of our product, <laughs> hello guys. Thanks. All right. It reminded me of how uh, OpenStack uh, was born in a crucible of fire. Um, our first customer, actually, uh, that was powered by what we built at NASA was actually the White House. And we had a pretty high-profile website thanks, that uh, the president had, uh, when he was a senator in Illinois, uh, kind of gotten a bunch of uh, support to build this thing that would provide visibility into $4 trillion of U.S. Uh, spending. And it's called usaspending.gov. And uh, we worked for about six months on what you might call OpenStack Alpha Alpha 0 .001 uh, to try to make this thing work. And you know, one thing I want to point out, a lot of the questions here about uh, how does OpenStack move from uh, being used by the early adopters to the enterprise. And I think the answer is innovators, uh, like the panel you just saw here uh, on the stage, folks like Surrender at Xerox Park. Uh, I mean, these, these guys have the courage to take a new technology and define some use cases that might not be their ERP systems, they're not the mission critical applications, uh, but they're big data applications, they're mobile applications, they're applications where you can run them maybe in multiple uh, computing environments, perhaps on multiple clouds, uh, where if your private cloud or if your public cloud for that matter uh, goes down, you've built your application to be resilient. And I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see as we see more adoption of OpenStack in the enterprise, you know, is this transition uh, of, of getting more and more workloads, more and more applications moving into environments where it doesn't matter if a server fails, or even if a rack fails, or if an entire cloud fails. And uh, you know, thought leaders like Adrian Cockcroft at Netflix uh, have uh, open source projects like Osgard, which are now starting to get integrated uh, into OpenStack and enable uh, this transition, and, and enable enterprises, frankly, to use OpenStack for more and more stuff. Uh, so um, anyway. Uh, I'm reminded of the crucible of fire of uh, Surrender Ready uh, in you know, the alpha version of our product almost a year and a half ago, um, you know, and, and you know, the White House uh, back when OpenStack was first formed. And I think that is the story of OpenStack. You know, it, was, it was forged in a crucible of fire. It was really put to a test. And I think the thing that enterprises need to realize is um, we wouldn't all be here. There wouldn't be thousands of people trying to solve this problem if it wasn't a problem. Uh, I think companies are realizing that there's a lot to be gained uh, by using OpenStack. And um, they're willing uh, to make investments in making the technology work, into figuring out um, ways to move all of the new workloads uh, to OpenStack and not leverage uh, existing commercial technologies to solve these, these new problems. So. so take a minute to tell us a little bit about Nebula, because you've got a somewhat unusual yep. approach to, no, to the OpenStack distribution. Yeah, I don't think it's an unusual approach, um, frankly, of, of taking a technology like this to market. Uh, you know, we take OpenStack and a whole bunch of other technologies and we put it into a controller. Uh, you can plug off-the-shelf industry standard <laughs> servers. HP is a partner of ours, Dell, IBM, uh, Cisco. Mm -hmm. And uh, you turn the thing on and, you know, it boots up as a cloud. And so our goal is to make that as easy as possible. And uh, we routinely install OpenStack clouds in uh, a couple of hours. And they work and they scale and they're reliable. And uh, that's really hard to do. I think that's been highlighted here. And uh, it's really hard to do even when every one of our customers has an identically configured system where we have spent you know, thousands of hours running tests 24 hours a day on the exact same servers. So when an enterprise brings in OpenStack, you know, Novo alone has 750 config options when you run it. So for any organization to bring in a technology with that kind of complexity and then try to make it run on any arbitrary network fabric, on any arbitrary server, in any arbitrary configuration with any arbitrary storage vendor, the combinatorial um, impact of that means you'll keep a consulting team busy forever uh, trying <laughs> to run that thing. So you have to make a choice. You know, do you need to run a cloud? eBay does, um, but most enterprises do not, uh, and they will buy a product like Nebula. So Surrender uh, mentioned the, the sort of the difficulties in say the upgrade cycle, mm -hmm. something that fairly commonly raised objection yep. about OpenStack. Yeah, I mean we put you know. You know, ten, tens of man years of work into that. Um, mm -hmm. 
Surrender can now download and upgrade and click upgrade, uh, and it works. Uh, but um, we should get them to do that, actually, because there's a, <laughs> there's a grizzly update out there for you, wherever you are. <laughs> I, I will do that. I will do that personally, uh, and it does work. Um, but I think that's a great that's a great example. Backups. Um, we do backups. You can backup and restore a Nebula Cloud. Um, you know, there's a lot of features, security features. OpenStack doesn't solve any of these problems. OpenStack doesn't solve the problem of how you orchestrate your network or your physical servers. It doesn't solve uh, security problems like how you use TPM, Secure Boot. Um, doesn't you know? It's unencrypted traffic. Um, it's, you, know, you, you have thousands of things you need to do to make OpenStack, which is kind of a reference implementation, uh, an operational cloud environment. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's what a public cloud, OpenStack isn't a cloud service or a cloud product. Um, Nebula is a cloud product. HP Cloud is a cloud service. Rackspace Cloud is a cloud service. So it needs to be productized or serviceitized in order to be used, period. Now, a number of people uh, who have been up on the stage uh, previously have talked about how they want to avoid the lock-in of choosing specific vendors. Yep. Um, so you are choosing a strategy that is very much actually oriented towards lock-in for convenience. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, what, what are we locking you into? Um, you can choose your favorite server brand. Um, so we're not locking you to servers. It's not like we're putting our logo on a super micro server and trying to sell you the servers um, at a huge markup. Um, though companies can do that successfully, we're not trying to do that. Um, we're not trying to convince you to lock your applications into a proprietary management framework. We're OpenStack. So as long as you're focusing your energy as a company on running on OpenStack, you can run on Nebula, you can run on HP Cloud, you can run on Rackspace Cloud. You know, you're not locking yourself into anything. Um, you did buy a box, and that box saved you thousands of hours of pain. <laughs> and to what degree does Nebula contain any proprietary extensions, and how do you feel about proprietary extensions to OpenStack in general? Uh, today, and, and actually our customers have asked for Nebula APIs, we don't have a single Nebula API. Everything our product does, it does with OpenStack APIs. And um, I think there is a case to be made for things that go beyond the scope of OpenStack, like infrastructure management. There is a case to be made for APIs that go beyond OpenStack. But um, we're 100% API compatible with OpenStack, and for that matter, we're API compatible with Amazon EC2 and Amazon S3 as well. And do you intend to maintain that compatibility, especially as the foundation uh, kind of pushes more towards uh, breaking that compatibility? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think the, you know, the, the most important thing, people ask what OpenStack is. It's an open source uh, reference implementation for a cloud. And the most um, prolific cloud today is the Amazon Web Services cloud. And I think as Google Compute Engine uh, continues to gain traction, we'll look at putting API support in there for that. Uh, it's, frankly, it's what our customers want. And, uh, API compatibility and interoperability is, is frankly a customer-driven thing. Mm -hmm. So what are the use cases that you think are suited for the Nebula approach versus, let's call it, you know, one of the software-only approaches? Well, I mean, I think if you're trying to build your own Amazon and be a service provider, I'd invest heavily in knowing how to do that. Um, if you've just got some folks that want to move something off of Amazon and you want to run that locally, we've got a great product. Um, if you uh, frankly, are an enterprise CIO that uh, is is used to things just working. We've got a great product. You know, if you've got a if you've got a bunch of existing investments in storage, you can plug a solid fire appliance into your Nebula, and it seamlessly mounts like a thumb drive on a laptop. Um, but it's hundreds of terabytes. Um, you can. We're working with other major tier one storage vendors uh, to have that same experience with the storage, you know, the the ecosystems of storage that you already have in your data center. And you simply can't do that with software. You know, if you can configure a software distribution in thousands of ways, what are you going to do when you call support and you know, you're going to send a consulting team in there to figure out how to make your storage work? And that is, not, you know, that is not a viable solution for an enterprise CIO. They want to be able to resolve that issue now. So OpenStack's got a lot of vendors involved um, in the community, and many of them are very, very large. Mm -hmm. um, for an enterprise who's looking at, you know, who should be my provider of OpenStack products and services, um, what's the compelling use case to go with a startup as opposed to an established vendor they have a relationship with? Well, I mean, I, I heard the phrase punch above their weight. I mean, for the small number of developers we have, we contribute a lot to OpenStack. Uh, so if you look at the, his, the whole history of OpenStack, um, you know, Nebula is one of the top five contributors of code of all time across all the projects in OpenStack. And it's because we have incredibly productive developers that have been involved in the project for a long time. And we have a lot of influence beyond just the code we write as well. So I think um, we're also Switzerland. We really don't care what servers you buy. We really don't care what storage you buy. Um, HP built some great servers, so does Dell. Um, you need to make that decision. And 
I don't want to lock you in based on proprietary management extensions and, and try to use these, these techniques that have been used for the past couple of decades to keep people buying the same switches, uh, the same servers, uh, the same storage. Uh, Nebula is Switzerland, and uh, it truly, ironically, uh, gives you the, the flexibility of not getting locked in. And I think a lot of other uh, companies uh, are going are to find it too easy to, mm -hmm. to slip down that path again. So what do you think is most important uh, for vendors to do in order to drive more uh, mainstream adoption of OpenStack? Well, I mean, I think the, the thing that we need to do is ensure that there is true uh, interoperability. Um, why, you ask, why choose Nebula? If Nebula just happens to be the fastest, easiest, most secure way to get a cloud running, the only reason you wouldn't choose it if we were incompatible with other clouds. And so what Jonathan and the foundation are doing to ensure that there's interoperability between clouds, if you know that Nebula can install a cloud in three hours, say you want to go and do your big OpenStack deployment, and you're going to go spend you know, millions of dollars on an army of consultants, you can go do that, and we can have your cloud up next Monday. Uh, and then while those consultants are toiling away, you can essentially hedge your bets. You know, and, but the, the key thing is there, you don't want Nebula to be incompatible with that OpenStack cloud you're building. So interoperability is key. And I hope this is just making it easier to run applications. So we're excited about Heap. We're excited about uh, the project that essentially provides cloud formation style application orchestration. Uh, so that there can be libraries of applications that you can just run. Uh, making it easier, especially in the enterprise, for people who don't know how to use a cloud to run applications on a cloud uh, is going to be critical to accelerating adoption. And uh, the community is, is working hard on that. We're going to make it really easy to run applications on Nebula. Uh, and we're going to do it in, in an open way so we're not locking you into a proprietary uh, pass layer uh, if you use our product. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Leah. I guess HP, William. We're not on stage together, are you? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Is there anything you can Yeah, you're supposed to stand. <laughs> so I want to play off a, a, a something that uh, that Chris was talking about, sure. which Chris has just mentioned the importance of the compatibility with, say, AWS APIs and in the future, say, GCE APIs. HP is actually deliberately moving away from that as the foundation as a whole. Um, you want to you want to give a, a viewpoint on that, since it's uh, the HP viewpoint is contrary to that. Nothing like starting with a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll play it somewhat, somewhat slightly contrarian. Um, I've been dealing with, with OpenStack and other open source projects for a real long time. Um, and there, you know, there's a big debate inside the community. There's a set of OpenStack people who want to be really tight to AWS, and there's a set of other people inside the community that, that don't. And, uh, most of them are arguing from either sides, and very few HP people are actually involved in either side of that argument. We're sort of sitting back in the background. But um, you know, if you think about it, the Amazon APIs are controlled by another company that isn't, but isn't A, both an open source company, and isn't also part of the OpenStack consortium. So sooner or later, um, I think, sitting on one side of the argument, you could see um, OpenStack becoming very, very large and very strong with a massive degree of adoption. And if you went one way support, trying to support AWS and compatibility, um, Amazon, the authors of those APIs, could go off in a totally different direction and make it really hard for the community to maintain anything because they don't, we, we don't control any of those APIs. There's no, there's no open way, just as I think Jonathan's over there, just as Jonathan was talking about the OpenStack Design Summit, we all come together every six months and talk about how we're advancing stuff. If the APIs are going to change in Nova, they're going to change because the community makes a decision about that changing. If Amazon wants to change the EC2 APIs, the EC2 APIs change. Mm -hmm. And this community, since most of you, I think, are going to I'll call you all open stackers, none of the people in this room would have a great effect on being able to, to choose that change. So you know, I can argue the other side, which is you know, there's a very large community, there's a lot of people who are using Amazon, and that's sort of that big de facto piece. Um, that's kind of the same line of reasoning that I think it was Bill Gates used about, of course Microsoft Windows is standard, everybody's using it. <laughs> right? So I kind of fall in either way, and I think um, 
HP in a number of these areas is kind of taking a wait and see position, right? We're, we're certainly doing some things in the public cloud, but you know, we don't want to stifle the debate that happened, started to happen. It wasn't in Hong Kong. I think it was actually in Portland, wasn't it? Um, around where we started to have this, it advanced more in Hong Kong, and I certainly expect uh, at the Ice House Summit in Atlanta for that dialogue to continue. I think once the dialogue is finished, then you'll see multiple vendors sort of immediately moving into that, because we're all interested in tracking, as Chris said, tracking the interoperability of OpenStack. Mm -hmm. so, so how does OpenStack fit into HP's strategy? Um, it's very, very crucial to HP's strategy. Um, HP <laughs> believes in what's kind of core to our strategy is something one or two of the other people have spoken about, sort of a hybrid cloud. Um, big belief that public cloud is really crucial for a lot of what people are doing with cloud, HP runs a, a OpenStack-based public cloud, but we also sell technology, um, software, hardware, storage, networking, to service providers around the world that are standing up public clouds. So we want to enable that, but we also recognize for, I think it was Ken Peppel said, for compliance reasons, for security reasons, I also sometimes even say for ego reasons, people sometimes want to run their own private cloud. And, you know, in order to be able to burst, move workloads from a private cloud to maybe a managed cloud up to a public cloud and back and forth, we wanted a common architecture, a common set of tools that we could use across all of this. And HP has a very long history in open source. So we looked at the different options and um, really chose OpenStack. We were involved with the folks at NASA and the folks at Rackspace helping to create the foundation. And that technology is used in products from at HP from both software to services to the public cloud. And you see us moving more and more into trying to fill that vision of where we think hybrid is going. And so HP is taking a particular sort of strategy as a vendor. Um, mm -hmm. You're not selling an OpenStack distribution, for instance. You've generally chosen OpenStack as, a, as such an open source core to commercial products. Um, any thoughts around, uh, around that strategy versus, let's say, you know, the type of, of work that Nebula is doing that's more core OpenStack? So I think um, what we're trying to do at HP is, is deliver cloud solutions to customers. And in certain parts of OpenStack, we're fairly core. I mean, we have a reasonable number of core contributors on most of the projects, including what I'll call a lot of the core projects. The PTL for Glance actually works for HP. Um, sorry, uh, Horizon. Um, and, but we've also done, I'll say, some of the other projects that we think address both the scale aspects and some of the enterprise aspects. So things like Triple uh, O, um, heat and bare metal provisioning are big areas that we've been making a lot of investments in. The PTL for two of those three projects are also HP employees. Um, we were co-authors of the security book along with you know, Rackspace and Nebula and the NSA and <laughs> now we know this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a variety of other people. So I would say that you know, the areas that, that we're spending a lot of our time in are in what I kind of consider the big install, upgrade, update space, that sort of intersection of triple O heat and bare metal provisioning, security, and then we've been doing a lot of work in the networking space. Um, so we're trying to augment some, some of both core, but also what we would consider the things that are needed for enterprises to successfully pick this stuff, stuff up and run with it. Now, of course, an enterprise who's deciding to get OpenStack as software really has two choices. They can choose to get OpenStack as a distribution, or they can choose to get OpenStack embedded in some other product like HP Cloud System Enterprise or IBM Cloud, Smart Cloud Orchestrator. Mm -hmm. or like, so why choose something like HP Cloud System Enterprise rather than choosing an OpenStack distribution? What's the well, advantage or disadvantage to doing so? So I think, um, I think there's, there's two... There's, I think there's a, a couple of different pieces for it. First, different customers have different requirements and different wants. And um, even from some of the panelists who've been up here, right, they're bringing it in on their own. I think it was the gentleman from eBay, the gentleman from eBay and PayPal. They're bringing it in, they're building it on their own. Um, there are other customers that really are looking for a base level solution. And, and I very much hearken this back to the early days of, of Linux. I've been doing this for, for a long time. Um, you know, 
even in the early days of Linux, right, there were a few people who would go off to kernel.org and they'd grab a kernel and they'd go off to various open source projects and put something together. And then there were really early, I mean, Ian Murdoch was a little late, later to it, but you know, Ian went off and built Debian and there were people who would just go and grab Debian. And those were both you know, open source ways of doing it, right? I haven't mentioned any of the Unix vendors that, that are out there. But if you look today, I don't think there's a single person in the audience that goes to kernel.org to get their Linux kernel today, right? Um, but some people pick it up through a distro like Red Hat. Others pick it up through a packaged, prepackaged almost appliance type system. So HP is trying to give customers choice. Some of them are going to build it on their own. Some of them are going to consume cloud products either through a managed service or through a public cloud. So what do you normally see as the typical use case for, let's say, HP Cloud System Enterprise versus, you know, someone who might be picking up a distro from someone like Red Hat? Um, it's a good question. So we talk to, obviously, HP is a huge company, and we talk to a lot of customers, and I spend a significant portion of my day, ergo why I'm in a black suit, in our executive briefing center. and and. I have talked to customers about OpenStack specifically and the use of OpenStack ranging from small teeny enterprises to huge global Fortune 10s, mm -hmm. government in sectors ranging from you know, retailing, manufacturing, people who build massive turbines, airlines, it, it, it runs the whole gamut. And I would say consistently that it, it really comes down to a set of business choices that they need to make. And as I said earlier, part of our strategy was trying to use this to build customer solutions. So in, in many instances, if I talk to the CIO of a, of a Fortune 500, she's trying to solve a specific business problem. And she thinks about it in terms of the problem she's trying to solve and the solution space to solve that problem. And that drives her decision of, do I build something based on a private system or a, or a public system, and if I'm rolling it on my own, you know, am I using a distribution, getting it from somewhere else? Um, I guess they're coming to take me away here. In <laughs> um, so I, I think you see it more that way. I, I think also a, HP's perspective on this has been to carefully look at where we wind up with the distribution space as well, because um, history is a great sort of predictor of the future, right? In the early days of of Linux, we had hundreds and hundreds of distributions. When I started my career in the really early days of, of Unix, um, I think it was 1981 or, or 82, there were more than 150 Unix licensees. By the time you got to 1992, there were less than 20. So I, I think you know, we could, if we aren't careful, we could wind up getting into the distribution wars with 50 different spins of, of this. And from HP's perspective, we've tried to focus more on not that side of it, but building solutions that customers can actually solve to real, real world ways of doing it, which I think is not too dissimilar from what Chris has been trying to do over at Nebula. Now, because of HP's position as an IT operations management tool vendor and the existence of you know, sort of a full featured cloud management platform and things like Cloud System Enterprise, you see not just the use case, I think, of the sort of net native applications, but also mm -hmm. people looking at moving existing legacy workloads. Oh, yeah. So what do you think OpenStack needs to do to enable that use case, to make it easier for customers to choose that? So I, I believe and, and HP is very heavily on this. We're in what we call the new style of IT. We've gone through the mainframe revolution, the client server revolution, and the cloud revolution. And, and if you think about the mainframe revolution for a second, in the early 80s, there were lots of CIOs that said, we're gonna move everything, we're gonna be on this new, on this new world in three years, or in three months. And there were massive amounts of transformation projects that just went up in smoke. And I think people have learned from that, and they're a lot more cautious about it. So we envision a world over the next maybe, say, five to 10 years where you have people, and we still have customers that still have small stuff on mainframes, right? So you've got people with a mainframe world, I'll call it a legacy or traditional client server world, and this new cloud world. I talk to, to companies that are doing greenfield work on the cloud. They're making business decisions. You may have an application that um, keeps you in compliance with the FDA but the FDA regs are changing in two years. 
So they make, a, again, a business decision about do we leave this where it is, or in two years do we re-implement it for a cloud world, or do we look at trying to migrate it right now? In many ways, we drive it more towards a business decision, but what we're trying to do in the products we build that talk to OpenStack and other things, when you look at some of the orchestration things that come out of HP, allow those orchestration products to manage both the client server world and the cloud world, to manage the traditional aspect of doing development, staging, production, move through there, which works really well for SOX compliance and other things, but also supporting the DevOps model. So you wind up with you know, tools that need to live in both of these worlds. And the unfortunate thing is, is if you talk to a, a CIO of a, of a global Fortune 50, they have to live in those two worlds for the next five years, right? It's gonna take a while for legislation to change. Mm -hmm. They have to live with that degree of compliance. So simply saying, oh, everybody's gonna be over here, that's not what the world, mm -hmm. we may all wish as technologists and engineers that everything could be over here. <laughs> but in the actual fact, most of you get paychecks, part of your payroll processing may still be running on a mainframe. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, we live in that world, it's the reality. And with net native applications and programmatic infrastructure and so forth, how is that affecting HP's outsourcing business? As people look at a new model of infrastructure yeah. and infrastructure management. I think the cool thing is I would say, um, I think that side of our business runs, runs really well because as companies more and more want to look at the technology today, they want to look at that greenfield piece, they still need to find somebody to manage their VAX 11780 running VMS. There's a very nice VAX 11780 downstairs when you walk in the history museum <laughs> and a PDP-7. But um, you know, all kidding aside, there's that degree of managing that long-term history. And what you find more and more corporations doing is they're attempting to outsource that part of it because frankly, finding somebody who knows how to manage a VMS machine today is pretty hard. So if you can outsource that to somebody like an HP where we have all that expertise, you can then take your, your in-house talent, which is usually very expensive, and focus them on where you want to go. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Good question. And Dave from SolidFire. Bit shift to the left. We'll all bit shift over one. So tell us how OpenStack is relevant to SolidFire and, how it, and what your role is. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Dave Wright. I'm the founder and CEO of, of SolidFire. And uh, you know, SolidFire, so we're a storage company. So we build uh, scale-out, high-performance storage specifically for public and private clouds. And, and so you can already see the intersection there, there with OpenStack. And we've, uh, as Jay mentioned at the beginning, been a longtime fan as well as contributor to OpenStack. And, were uh, very heavily involved in the initial creation of the Cinder Block Storage Project and, and the contributions uh, in that area. And the reason that we found it such a strategic place to invest, and even as a, a smaller startup wanted to put resources into it, is that we, we did see this potential to become a universal cloud operating system, and one that was an open platform that anyone could plug into. Um, and when some of the customers in the, the last session talked about um, you know, wanting this vendor neutrality, wanting the ability to remove vendor lock-in and have the ability to switch in different solutions and choose the best kind of solutions to their problems, that's a great fit to a company like us who, uh, you know, is an innovative storage company. And, uh, and we want to be able to remove the barriers to vendor lock-in that exist in other ecosystems. And, and when the predominant virtualization vendor today is 80% owned by a storage company, <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's clear incentive to make that successful. And so we want, obviously, very much to see OpenStack and other uh, open cloud projects be successful. Mm -hmm. So storage architecture has always been an interesting question with OpenStack. And even as you go, go from OpenStack distribution to distribution, you find that the choice of basically the backing store is different, right? Mm -hmm. There's the question of, do I use Ceph? Do I use Cinder? Right? Folks who are still on old, old Nova volume. Um, how, do cu how should customers think about their storage choices? So, uh, you know, obviously every, app, every set of application, every use cases, you're going to have different needs. Um, generally, I break it down into, and, and I think this is really where the storage world is moving to, you're going to have a capacity-optimized storage platform. Uh, you're going to have a platform that you're really looking at, lowest cost per gigabyte, something that you're going to store massive amounts of data, uh, either for backup, archive, batch processing, 
uh, content storage, whatever. Uh, and that's more and more becoming object storage. And obviously, uh, you know, OpenStack has the Swift project. It has an open, uh, you know, open source object storage project that's part, part of that. Uh, and there are plenty of other object storage vendors that are now integrating with OpenStack to provide alternatives to that. Ceph, uh, Ceph is another open source project, but there are other commercial object storage vendors that want to plug in and offer that kind of capacity-oriented layer. Um, but then the other side of it is, is performance-optimized storage. And, and in any uh, environment, you're going to need the primary block storage for the virtual machines, the images, the databases, and that side of things. Um, and that side of it is, at least on the open source side of things, a lot less mature. There's, there's Nova volumes, there's kind of basic Linux iSCSI. But when you get to high scale, high performance, highly available block storage, you tend to fall into the realm of proprietary vendors. Um, but one of the great things about the OpenStack architecture, and, and Cinder specifically, is it has a model that allows many different vendors to plug into that, and, and SolidFire as well as others have done that. And there's a richness of choice there that doesn't exist uh, as well in other platforms. And, and so um, based on the requirements for the performance storage, the scale of it, uh, the price, quality of service, and other things that may be important to customers, they can decide which of those solutions is going to work. So we've, we've hit the point um, earlier in this panel around uh, being locked into potentially your hardware vendors. Um, to what degree is it important initially for customers to pick the exact right things versus switching architectures midstream? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, obviously OpenStack gives you that ability. Um, that being said, nobody wants to change the tires on a, on a car while it's uh, driving down the highway, even if, you know, it was possible to do that. Um, and so we do think part of that upfront assessment process of what the use cases are for this cloud, what you're going to be putting on it near term, and where you might want to go longer term, uh, it, it is very important because um, you could actually, in some cases, with the wrong choice, destroy the user experience in that environment. And storage is one of those things that is very centric to having a good user experience for your users of this cloud, um, where you might turn the organization off of it if you have a bad experience there. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, important choices to go into it up front, but we think making a good assessment and good choice on the storage side of things is, is absolutely essential to having that good, successful first experience with whatever that use case is that then you can build on for other use cases. Mm -hmm. And so when do you think it's important for customers to make those decisions? Um, you know, how far do they have to be beyond the proof of concept stage? Yeah, I, 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 th I certainly think at the point that you're going to do a proof of concept, you need to at least understand what the options are out there and what the, the pros and cons and the trade-offs are. Um, and whether you're doing a POC with the kind of final solution or whether you're just trying to get a handle on OpenStack itself, certainly by the time you've moved through the OpenStack evaluation process and made the commitment that, you know what, I'm definitely moving forward with OpenStack, uh, you need to get pretty serious about understanding what storage and what platforms you want to deploy that on. Because um, if you just take something that may have been okay for an OpenStack evaluation and try to roll it into production, um, there's a good chance that you are going to hit stumbling blocks there and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the user experience. So to what degree do you find that your products or the products of competing storage vendors or other people in sort of the hardware chain get pushed by professional services organizations helping users deploy OpenStack versus independent user evaluation without the aid of a professional services firm? Yeah, and, and we see both of those. Um, we deal a lot in the service provider space. We help a lot of cloud providers, both OpenStack and, and non-OpenStack cloud providers uh, with the storage for their clouds. In a lot of cases, that is very self-directed. Again, they have the expertise in their organizations to go out and make the evaluations on the infrastructure side of things. But as we move into the enterprise, uh, and particularly uh, as you move into OpenStack, uh, specifically there is um, you know, more of a drift towards consultants, system integrators, uh, and, and other vendors that can help them put together a solution. And, and so we really work through both of those, both direct as well as through channel partners. Mm -hmm. So cooperation and competition in the OpenStack vendor ecosystem can complicate uh, some things, especially as the number of vendors who want to plug into OpenStack proliferate. Mm -hmm. um, as we look at more and more curated distributions of OpenStack, we see that you know the vendors, whether they're canonical or Red Hat, or essentially choose which are the which particular vendors they're going to support within their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. How does that impact smaller vendors, um, and how does that impact uh, enterprise choice and what enterprises should be thinking about when they're looking at picking a distro and, and picking the hardware that goes with it? Especially as uh, a bunch of people have already brought up the interoperability issues between sure. different solutions that should work together but don't. Yeah, and, and the approach for SolidFire has always been to contribute to the core first and, and put our focus on the contributions that we're making, the integration and testing that we're doing with this, the core of, uh, of OpenStack because that is the base that all these distributions are picking up. 
Um, and if we can work with those vendors to prove that, hey, we are fully compatible with the entire core of OpenStack, and yes, we may need to jump through some hoops of a certification process with that vendor, and, and we've done that with companies like Nebula, with Rackspace Private Cloud's uh, distribution, as well as uh, Red Hat, um, it makes that process a lot easier. Whereas uh, if you just try to kind of do an end run around the community and just go to a vendor and say, you know, hey, we're gonna buddy up and we're gonna take this product to market and you're gonna stamp a seal of certification on here, but I actually don't support that core platform, that's where you get those lock-in effects um, because that is where if the customer wants to then move to a different distribution or a different platform and that solution wasn't actually in the core distribution, then they're gonna run into trouble. So who do you find your typical OpenStack using customer to be? Yeah, we see a, a good mix of service provider and enterprise these days. Uh, in the last, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, year and a half since we've been selling the product, early on it was it was almost entirely service provider that was adopting OpenStack. Uh, you know, the move to public cloud and that model in the service provider space is rapidly underway. Everybody's trying to compete with Amazon and, and differentiate there, and and so we saw strong adoption of OpenStack in the service provider community. Um, but we are now seeing this shift to more balance between service provider and enterprise. And on the enterprise side, um, there's a range of companies. There's internet companies uh, that are using uh, OpenStack with SolidFire, but we also have traditional retailers. Uh, we have um, other technology companies as well as non-technology companies. And you know, the use cases have been discussed, and, and it's really the same for us. Uh, dev test, big data, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service internally, uh, as well as SaaS applications and, and vertical uh, applications. You know, again, on OpenStack, not a lot of the traditional enterprise uh, legacy applications being deployed today, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that in all of these cases, they look this as a platform that can be a broad infrastructure management platform, including those applications in the future. So, a question for all three of you. Um, how should customers think about assembling an OpenStack-based solution? I, I would... <laughs> I would plug a solid fire uh, appliance into some HP servers into a Nebula box and turn turn it on. There you go. <laughs> my esteemed my esteemed colleague from Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. I could make other suggestions, but you know, you know so I think. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple of options that are out there. So certainly you can work with a, a consultant like Selenia up front to really understand what you're trying to solve. Somebody that knows the ecosystem and can point out the vendors and partners that can make the kind of best solution there. Uh, and in, in a lot of enterprise cases, that is the best option because unless they want to spend a lot of time getting into the community, doing the research, sorting through the FUD and the, the you know, vendor hyperbole out there, uh, they're not going to know what works and what doesn't. And, and so that's you know, really a good way for a lot of enterprises to start. Um, in a lot of cases, though, I think we're going to see the same thing with uh, OpenStack that we saw with Linux in the enterprise, which is it didn't start as a, as a big kind of tops-down project. It started because somebody had a need, and they didn't have the budget to go out and buy, you know, a big system. And so they just they downloaded some open source software, they put it on some servers, and they started using it. And before you know it, that thing which wasn't actually that important has some really important stuff on it, and it gets elevated up. And so um, I think we're going to see both a tops-down approach as well as a bottoms-up approach uh, to op how OpenStack ends up pervading the enterprise. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, giving an, an honest one other than, than the Switzerland comment, um, you know, it, it, it starts from two sides, as, as he said. But I, I think... You, the customer is generally trying to re, trying to achieve a business outcome, right? So, and they're trying to re, trying to achieve this business outcome in an area where they have less budget, they need it faster, and, and others. And a you know a rapid way of doing it is you you know you've got younger, more recent graduates. They're more familiar with this technology. They understand how open source works. They get that. They're trying to do that. But in the same instance, the person who's trying to get the business outcome is trying to balance this. So I think we wind up seeing, at least at HP, um, we're starting to reach a point of, and I think it was actually Gardner that called it out, but I'll, I think you guys call it strategic adoption. So you're starting to see um, accounts for which cloud is sort of their strategic th direction they're going, and then there's a small team of people who, who apply it by grabbing some of the source code, grabbing what else is open source, and really trying to do it as quickly as possible. And in many ways, I think that drives and frames how they think about where they're trying to get to. So what can the developers do and what's the business outcome I'm trying to achieve? Questions from the audience for this group? What is OpenStack and what is it trying to achieve? 
I think in our in our industry, you know, biggest problem is uh, you know a lot of businessmen actually they are not technically savvy. While on the other hand, a lot of technologists uh, typically lack, you know, business sense. My question is, you know, what are innovations driving open stack uh, development? By that means not only adoption. I mean, oh, what are innovations driving? open stack progress. By that means progress not only adoption, I'm most interested in, in development, open stack development. Um, so you know, I'll answer that from, from my perspective in the, the storage you know, part specifically, um, which is that you know, in the last kind of um, uh, two and a half years that we've been contributing to open stack, we, we initially were focused on you know, we need to get this to parity with Amazon. And, and we talked about earlier, that's where a lot of people started with OpenStack is we've got to get the basics filled out. Um, and now in terms of where storage is going, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think really the question is really about Amazon anymore. The question is about what do the users need to run a wider range of applications on OpenStack? And what are the questions you have to answer about storage to make that successful? And there are a number, I mean, storage is one of the most complex part of the infrastructure, and to be able to run very complex, very performant applications, there are questions that need to be answered. Questions like the backup question, and, and how do you, you know, back up an OpenStack cloud? Questions around quality of service and performance, and how do you get the guaranteed performance to each of these applications uh, in a cloud? Uh, things like remote replication, disaster recovery, live workload migrations, and other things that are just very instrumental to the way that people think about enterprise architecture today. Um, because we are looking to expand the use cases for OpenStack beyond just cloud-native applications where the data doesn't matter and you can assume the performance is horrible. Uh, because that's not the majority of the world we live in today. So that's really where the innovation is going in the storage side and where we're contributing uh, on the storage side to OpenStack to broaden the number of use cases that can use uh, OpenStack on storage. Yeah. Um, this question is for Chris. Hi, Chris. Greg, I just see bright lights. Yes, he's yeah. right. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay. Yeah, um, the Labula was uh, started from a uh, trailer in NASA. Um, I know NASA has uh, enough data center. Why you started the Labula in a trailer? Is this to show off the staff street of uh, Silicon Valley? I, I heard security, but I wasn't clear on the question. Oh, sorry. Is there any problem? Um, Labula was built in the trailer of Lhasa, or container-like trailer. Ah. And I think originally it was easier for me to use semi-trucks than build new facilities. So we were using big shipping containers to put some of the servers. Uh, and I think that's been an approach some big service providers have used, uh, but that is somewhat more of a historical uh, fact uh, you know, than it is uh, something that is really, I, th I think the, th the other thing is, is that we didn't want people to manage servers, and people don't like to work in shipping containers in the middle of the field. So uh, <laughs> it was a way to kind of solve both of those problems at once. <laughs> yeah, actually a couple questions. Uh, the first question that, as the panel uh, already mentioned, that uh, OpenStack is not our box-ready product, is a reference implementation model. So in your own experience, that how much work you have to put in into alpha product and finally into a product ready for enterprise use. And on the enterprise use that the ready product, that how much uh, the OpenStack cost still, I mean, that in, in the, how much portion the OpenStack cost still occupy. And the second question is that with so many uh, companies jump on the uh, OpenStack bandwagon, uh, how do you see down the road that you see a lot of MMA or you see a lot of uh, bloodshed? Thank you. So I, I'll touch on the first question, which you know, I think was about the amount of effort you know, required to kind of uh, you know, turn OpenStack into a product or, or actually kind of use it as, as a product. And you know, I, don't, I don't want to sell short the advances that the community has made to not necessarily completely turn uh, OpenStack into a product, but make it actually something that is downloadable and usable. Make it something that actually has decent documentation. Make it something that people actually can play around with. And to go to the point of actually putting it in production, there, there probably is a need to bring in some outside expertise, to bring in some vendors, 
and to really think through what you're trying to do with it. Um, but the reality is it has come a long way from where it used to be. And there are some great guides out there, great tutorials, great documentation that allow people to actually get it up and running and get started with it. And, and yes, if you're gonna run it at scale, you probably need to work with some people that have experience and, and can guide you uh, on the right way to, to make that be successful. Um, but I don't want people to be scared about this. This is not alpha level code, code right? We're, we're at version eight going on version nine, right? Windows is only on version eight, so we're, we're way ahead of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Linux 2.0. I, I think um, one of the interesting things about OpenStack is we have a lot of people focusing on greenfield deployments and standing it up and you know, you can install it and you can go ahead and use it. What really happens in an enterprise is, you know, you install it and for the next 15 years you use it. So it's, it's not simply about just standing it up. There's a whole life cycle management surrounding this. And, you know, as, as, as I, I spoke a little bit about where we're investing our sort of, you know, engineering work and others, it, it's helping to build things like Triple O and, and heat and some of the things that help both manage the life cycle of owning this, but also help orchestrate and manage the infrastructure side as a service. For folks the, who don't know, can you explain Triple O and heat? Sure. So um, heat is uh, Chris mentioned it. A couple of others. So heat's heat's uh, the project inside uh, OpenStack uh, around orchestration, but it's not necessarily orchestration for the applications running in the application la layer. It's orchestration around the infrastructure. So it's how do you orchestrate all the different services that are inside of the cloud that you're running that, are, that the applications are then running on top of it. Triple O stands for OpenStack on OpenStack. And, and the idea behind that is actually installing and bringing up and managing OpenStack with effectively OpenStack. So you have a, an under cloud and an over cloud and you know, I can get into all of the technology of it. It started as a project at, um, I want to say it was San Diego, uh, where a set of us got together to talk about it. But where a lot of this came from is if you look at OpenStack in the really early days, sort of Cactus Diablo, um, a cloud was really a rack or a, a set of racks. And as you get customers that really are trying to deploy in the large, right, people want to deploy this in not one data center, but two or three. And the whole installation paradigm when you're trying to install in, let's say, a data center that has 30 or 40,000 servers, that's drastically different than if you're trying to install on two or three or four racks, right? Or e even if you're trying to install on a semi. Um, and the nice thing about a container, it's the same problem as a data center, right? What you really want to do is be able to power that sucker up and within you know, three to four hours be able to provision storage and compute and other services. And ideally, you'd like one person to throw the switch and that's all. So um, for OpenStack in the enterprise, that's sort of the stuff that we're working on. And that's where some of the challenges come in, right? That's where you wind up getting some consultants to come in and others. It's not necessarily to first stand it up. It's made huge advances in the last three releases of, of getting OpenStack to stand up. If you tried to do it with Cactus or Diablo, you really needed to work on the project to understand how to do it. If you do it with Grizzly or, you know, and Havana, it's actually pretty easy now. But where the challenge comes is if you run it for a while, how do you upgrade it? The gentleman at Park, right? He's <laughs> trying to figure out how he gets the latest version. That's where a lot of the challenge comes in. One thing I'll also say is we're talking about product <clears throat> features here. When you talk about upgrading something or installing something, am I installing it on a uh, large-scale data center infrastructure, hyperscale infrastructure, or am I installing it on a laptop? Yeah. Right? And I think that um, the whole idea of OpenStack is that companies like Nebula can productize it as an appliance that plugs into HP servers and, and uh, solid fire storage. Uh, HP can turn it into a public cloud. Rackspace can turn it into a public cloud. And enterprise can go turn it into something that powers eBay or PayPal. Um, you, know, it, you have the flexibility of doing whatever you want with it. And in some cases, as an enterprise, you should buy it as a product and not worry about how it works. That's what Amazon is. You pull out your credit card and you start consuming services. And that's easy, and you put all of your energy into making your application run on Amazon. Um, that, if, you, if you want that exact same experience, but you want it in a, you know, in a data center next to your existing data, that's what Nebula's for. If you want to go build a massive service and go compete with Amazon, 
that's where you want to go bring in an army of consultants and, and go differentiate your service offering and tailor it and, and leverage your assets that, that are unique to your organization. It's all about abstractions, right? And I think what OpenStack provides is an abstraction for the entire computer industry, right? Whether, and, and the thing that we have to do uh, to make this thing innovative and successful in the future is make sure there's a place for all these companies to plug into it and that the community uh, welcomes and, and is constantly bringing in these new innovative features. Who knows what storage is going to look like in five years or ten years? I don't. Uh, but I know as new products come out, it will change the abstractions that exist between things running in memory in a, in a CPU and the things that are in storage. Object Store is just the most recent iteration of this. But I think that's where we have to, you know, mm -hmm. OpenStack brings the computer industry back together. It's, it's not all happening in a secret room in Redmond or in Los Altos, right? Uh, you know, we are all coming together and we're trying to figure out how to build the next generation of computing together. And, and there's a place for all these vendors to plug their products in uh, in a way that they work together. And I would just add one thing, which is if there's something you specifically want to see coming out of OpenStack, we'll all be in Atlanta the second week of May. Come, <laughs> you know, put, put code in, affect how, affect how it works, get a voice. And surprisingly, I think it was Jonathan said, there are multiple enterprise class customers now that are actually putting code back in and participating in defining where this goes. It's very vibrant as an open source community. Yeah, you, you had a question about uh, the, the number of companies that are in this ecosystem in M&A, and, and I think there's two things to realize. One is that a lot of the companies that are in this ecosystem um, are established companies and are not exclusively OpenStack companies. SolidFire is, is you know, a great example of that. We do a portion of our business in OpenStack. We do a large portion somewhere else. Uh, and so I don't think there's a, there needs to be an assumption that there's too many companies involved in OpenStack and there's got to be some kind of shakeout. Um, in fact, I would argue there's probably far more opportunity in the OpenStack ecosystem uh, than, than there are companies to realize it at this point. And, and so I think there are going to be some very innovative startups spawned in different areas of the uh, OpenStack ecosystem. And we've already seen that with companies like, uh, like Nicira and uh, Nebula and others. And, and so I think there's great opportunity for startups in this ecosystem. It's not overly crowded. Hello. Hello. Uh, really quick, two questions. Uh, one question for William uh, for, from HP, one for Chris. Um, so first question uh, for HP is, you mentioned uh, uh, Triple O. We are very interested in uh, Triple O. So the quick question is how mature Triple O it is and uh, any uh, live uh, massive production system actually initiated by Triple O? Uh, that's first question. Second question for Chris is, uh, Nubular, you know, is like kind of like a triple O type of appliance. So basically, you are the seed cloud or the cloud initiator. Uh, what uh, technology behind using triple O or using some like a uh, racer format or something, you know, technology like that? Or uh, can I not only doing the cloud initiator for the OpenStack property, I have my own private cloud, can I use your appliance to have some customized image to initiate as my private cloud? So real short on Triple O. Triple O is a project that's um, still effectively in incubation, so it hasn't, its, its core technology hasn't released inside, and if I remember correctly, I mean, I, if I remember correctly, I think their first instance of it is supposed to be an ice house. I'm looking for Jonathan. He can check me and keep me honest. Is it ice house? So um, the, in, in terms of its degree of maturity, you can go in and get the code now and, and take a look at it. There's um, a significant number of developers from both uh, HP, Red Hat, and one or two other vendors that are working on it. Um, so the intention, I think, in Ice House is for them to be able to stand up not only, you know, racks of servers, but rows of racks of servers in a data center. The long-term goal is for it to be able to basically stand up a complete data center. But it's an incubation. It's a short Yeah, answer. it's an incubated project. I mean, our product today, you plug Ships. servers into it and it works. It, it's a shipping product. It's been shipping since April of last year. Uh, we have you know, customers using it every day. So I think that's the difference. I, I think as these technologies in OpenStack evolve, we're closely watching them because the last thing we want to do is put a lot of our uh, limited resources as a, as a startup uh, on something the community solved. So we have to pick, you know, very careful, pick the technologies we invest in very carefully. We use a lot of uh, the core OpenStack technology in our product uh, 
and that's why we effectively have you know thousands of developers, but we don't. We're small. Yeah, time for one final question. So I have a comment and a question for you, Chris. And comment, everyone is welcome to comment on. I feel uh, OpenStack, what it really is enabling is defining APIs for managing a set of disparate resources. And maybe over the next one year, we're going to start seeing more and more vendors supporting those APIs out of the box, allowing customers to kind of create custom solutions for their use cases, regardless of vendor, because almost everyone is supporting these APIs. Uh, yeah, that's, I, that's the comment. I, I, yeah, I would just, just comment on that. I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why when I, refer, when I refer to OpenStack as a cloud operating system, to me, it's like the Windows API or the Unix API. This is the infrastructure API. And it is going to provide a centralized point for all of these tool vendors who used to have to do this proprietary integration with every piece of hardware, with every stack that came out, um, gives them a central point to build that. And it's going to create much more powerful, robust um, management orchestration tools, as well as development platforms. And we're seeing the layers now start to appear in both open source as well as proprietary products on top of this core OpenStack API and, you know, the question about Amazon capability, look, I think in five years the question is going to be turning the other way around. Everybody's going to be asking Amazon, where's the OpenStack capability? Because it is going to be the far more universal platform. Amazon will always be a one vendor platform. Absolutely. Yeah, I keep saying that. People keep telling me I'm crazy. But one day, uh, <laughs> Amazon will support the OpenStack API. No, I think that, um, <laughs> mark my words, <laughs> that's going to get retweeted. So, so I think, you know, seriously though, I, I think that uh, what we have to do um, is be open to new ways of introducing, I mean, look at Seagate putting Ethernet ports on hard drives that support Swift object store directly. I don't know what the right answer is, but I do know that OpenStack provides a way for all the stuff to plug together to actually build systems. And that's very different uh, than taking software written in 1995 and putting it in a holodeck and it'll run like it's 1995 in the year 2025 you know, that's a very different, if you look at what people in the OpenStack community are trying to do, they're trying to innovate. Uh, they're trying to power next generation applications. They're trying to take next generation hardware and put it to use in hyperscale data centers to power the applications of tomorrow. Uh, this isn't about yesterday's software, and it's not about tricking yesterday's software into thinking that nothing's changing. It's about enabling the next generation of software to use the power of infrastructure to change the world. which was around the Nebula controller, I was curious to know um, what's the starting size, what's the maximum size that Nebula can support, and how, how does this kind of scale? I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch. Uh, we, have, we have a booth back there. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a controller. It powers a rack. Um, you know, it, it can power multiple racks. Uh, you don't want to buy it for just one server, so it's kind of a mid-range solution right now. Thank you. Okay, right. thank you very much, panel. Fantastic. Thank you. So Lydia's going to give us some closing comments, uh, and then I'll get up. We'll wrap up this section and get started with the next. So of all of you who came here thinking, you know, is OpenStack ready for my organization, how many of you changed your mind today based on what you heard? <laughs> Yeah, I was about to ask that. Uh, based on what you've heard about maturity and everybody else's challenges. And for how many of you think it's more likely that, the, that there's more maturity than you thought there was? Hands? <laughs> <laughs> I think that to sort of contextualize the experiences of a lot of the people who, uh, who did end testimonials here, um, one of the things you're seeing is you're seeing folks who deployed in an earlier time frame, right? If you're going to go out and you're going to deploy using Havana today on a, on a current distribution, you're going to have a different experience than these folks who have been using OpenStack for a year or two. Um, but you're still probably going to encounter challenges. I think you know, the folks like Selenia and so forth who are seeing current deployments are still seeing those challenges. The question for you is probably going to be, right, is what, do I, what I want to get done for my business worth the hassle? And is anything else going to be any less hassle than working with OpenStack? 
But in the end, you're really going to make a business decision of, is this the right thing for me? Right? What is the level of readiness in my organization to do this myself? Do I have the resources? Can I hire the resources? Am I going to need to work with professional services? And I'm going to need to work with a managed services provider on an ongoing basis. How does that change my cost equation when I was looking at, let's say, you know, standing up a private cloud in-house versus going to Amazon, for instance? Um, Right. The additional personnel cost is going to influence my overall total cost of the, of the solution. And what is my total cost of ownership over the years? And then what are all the components that I need to build, get together, integrate, buy, um, that are going to make a solution possible? Right. So you're still looking at what is functionally a non-trivial deployment. Um, but the question is, at your sort of you know, technology company relatively early adopter state, is OpenStack ready enough for you, even if they're not necessarily ready enough for your average you know, non-technology company with non-net native use cases? So I hope this has been a good day. Um, I hope that this has been thought provoking um, and that the panelists have been helpful. And uh, thanks for having me here too. If you'll stay, thank you very much.